unleashing female power. Being a disruptor. I'm always constantly telling the truth. I love art, art, art. That's all her life. She's alive and female. Being a woman, what it meant. Prove him wrong. Girls, 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 I'm the world. We're back in the place. Welcome to the Art Pod. I'm your host, Carolina, and I'll be your guide through this Pandora's box. Strap yourselves in for a journey through the art world where we bring you candid conversations, untold stories, uncover industry secrets, and celebrate the women who are shaping its future. Because in the Art Pod, the spotlight is always on the girls. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Art Pod. My guest today is Clara Andrade Pereira. Right. Um, so a little bit about Clara. She is the executive director of Untitled Art Fairs and a guest professor in the Global Art Market Program at Pereira A, a Plus D in Valencia and Art Market Management at Rey Juan Carlos University in Madrid. Prior to that, she led the curatorial programming development and VIP de- departments at the fair and held various director positions at galleries in New York, London, and Portugal. Clara also co-founded La Pera Projects, a digital curatorial platform that ran from 2020 to 2023 and focused on dem- democratizing contemporary art collecting. Leveraging a global network of artists, collectors, and organizations, her expertise lies in connecting and promoting uh, emerging artist positions um, internationally and bringing accessibility to the art world. Clara graduated with honors after completing a BA in art history from the Complutense University of Madrid. Among many specialization courses, Clara holds an executive program, International Leadership and Visual Arts Management, led jointly by NYU, Guggenheim Museum Bilbao, and the, and the University of Deusto in Spain. So let's get into it because you've worked all around the world. <laughs> so I want to start with your position as the executive director at Untitled Art Fairs, um, because you were also you've held different positions there. So you were the head of VIP relations for about four years. You were the director of development and programming for almost a year. Then you went on to be the director of development and curatorial affairs for a year. And finally, you became the executive director. Um, So maybe let's begin with telling everybody a little bit about Untitled first. Absolutely. Well, I want to start by saying thank you for having me. Uh, I love what you're doing at the airport. Um, So let's start with Untitled first. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, um, For Many that might not know about Untitled yet, uh, Untitled Art Fair was founded in 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it takes place in December during Miami Art Week. And we also held two, uh, sorry, four editions of the fair in San Francisco from 2017 to 2020. Um, many asked me, uh, many people ask me what makes Untitled different or you know, uh, there is a big competition during Miami Art Week, yeah. but it's also, there is a big competition with art fairs around the world. I would say that for us uh, at Untitled, I, uh, one of the key components of the fair is that curatorial identifier, that curatorial ident- uh, integrity. Uh, we, um, our teams very much emphasize uh, curatorial direction, programming, uh, we've been working with guest creators over the years. We have an artistic director that uh, supports uh, the curatorial selection. And we also, as, as, as you know, we also emphasize um, and organize each edition uh, with curatorial themes. So I feel that we have a very unique product in Miami um, that we heavily and constantly work on continuing uh, um, strengthening those ties with the curatorial, uh, uh, the curatorial direction uh, by inviting galleries from um, international galleries. I think that something that is very important to us is that um, international component uh, that um, those um, critical issues and, 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 and key components of the fair as giving visibility to uh, diversity to inclusivity and to accessibility in the art world. So um, Untitled, um, I mean, I've been working at Untitled since seven years. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm very proud of uh, what we are doing and uh, also the new directions uh, that the fair is taking. I am very happy to be uh, announcing that we are expanding to a new location soon. After San Francisco, Mm -hmm. uh, the last edition was... uh, 
uh, January 2020. So for obvious reasons, uh, after the pandemic, the key priority for the team was coming back to Miami uh, and establishing back, you know, the, the fair uh, in Miami Beach. Uh, but definitely we've been looking at what is next, right? Um, and we will be announcing very soon an expansion to a new location. So, Oh, that's exciting yeah. news. I haven't been to the one in San Francisco, but I've been to the one in, in Miami. Um, have you guys always been at that location in Miami always. Beach? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a beautiful location. A location that I would say that uh, we have an initiative that is called our Untitled Art Ambassadors Committee. Mm -hmm. And one of uh, the committee me members mentioned to me, well, Clara, you actually have the best real estate for you an do. art fair in the U.S. If I can expand on that, I think that we have the best real estate for an art fair in the world. I think that is like, you know, a very, like, you know, a key component also to the nature of Untitled. That location mm -hmm. is a location on the sands of Miami Beach. It's a location, I mean, our teams have always prioritized the way that we show and showcase art. So it's not only by uh, organizing a very easy layout in terms of the floor plan, but also giving a space, like uh, we have an a tent with a very special light. We have natural light, which is not uh, like a, um, a component uh, that is like, you know, uh, that other fairs have. So I think that that is like, you know, in very important for us, uh, something that definitely many galleries, artists, and, you know, um, collectors, institutions, and art fair attendees very much welcome and appreciate. And it's an enjoyable experience. It's like, you know, you can have, um, you, can, you can go to an art fair and you can spend like uh, limited time uh, mm -hmm. in the art fair. And people like to stay at Untitled. People like to hang on the VIP lounge and then go back, like check some other artists, like go to, uh, you know, I think that is very, it's a very easy, and pleasant experience that we have with that location. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's beautiful. You can literally go to the fair and then just stay on the beach and like go in the water. It's it's absolutely beautiful. Like when I think of Miami, that's what I think of. Sometimes it's a little bit problematic. I okay. remember when I, I was uh, leading the VP department uh, as head of VP relations that I, I hold that position for four years at Untitled. And sometimes you have like attendees that they come with that kind of swimsuit like beach yeah. outfit and it's like guys this is an art fair can yeah. you please put your t-shirt on yeah but besides that uh it is great it's a very welcoming very pleasant location and it's a great uh, uh venue to showcase art yeah and i'm glad that you touched on the fact that you plan themes um because um last year's was um really great um what did oh so last year untitled art fair focused on digital innovations and inclusivity in the art world it was one of the largest and most diverse editions to date um is creating accessibility um something that you're very passionate about um what's kind of the theme for this year absolutely let me like contextualize a little bit the yeah. curatorial themes as i said the curatorial identifier and that curatorial integrity is key to our mm -hmm. teams. Last year, we revolved the edition on two curatorial themes. One was gender equality in the arts mm -hmm. and the other one was curating in the digital age. Um, I, will, I will touch on what will be the theme for this year. Definitely accessibility and bringing the key issues and concerns for our industry is like essential for our team. I feel that again, as, um, as an art fair organizer, I always ask myself, how do we uh, distinguish our brand and our fair from others, right? Not only within the Miami context, but also US and international mm -hmm. art fairs. Uh, and uh, this is very unique to the Untitled brand. Um, this year, the theme is creating a cultural and curatorial bridge between the East and the West. Okay. We are welcoming guest curators to help support and advise on the selection pro process uh, in order to make sure that we are um, touching all the different key cities and, you know, um, and, and, and critical curatorial issues in those areas. Uh, those curators are Katy Juan from Jeffrey Deitch and mm -hmm. Jun Min Cho from White Noise in Seoul. It's been great to work with them and to learn from them. Uh, very important to say as well that this is not whatsoever a focus on Asia. I think that it, what is key, uh, considering that the art market and the world is very US, Eurocentric, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, directed is very essential for us to, to make sure that we are also looking at other cities and other ways of doing, like bring that global approach uh, to the sands of Miami Beach, to the Untitled Art brand and to the fair. Uh, and I think that this has been also very, very highly welcomed by our galleries and exhibitors and artists. We couldn't do it without them. I always say that an art fair is uh, the galleries and the artists and mm -hmm. all the art players that help support our vision. So definitely we are having lots of conversations with galleries. Every time that we put together a curatorial theme, we organize uh, curatorial meetings to discuss the theme, to help them learn what is this of East Miss West, right? And is this a focus on Asia? No, we want to create a cultural bridge. We want to look at having a gallery from Brazil in direct conversation with a gallery from the US, from Europe or from Asia. And I think that this is a very rewarding process. I think that it's essential to look a little bit outside the box mm -hmm. and also to help what is the power of the art fair, to help support this, uh, these uh, different approaches, these different cultures, and also help support and create those markets. Yeah, those no, that's, that's great. And you touched a little bit about the galleries that show with Untitled. Yeah. Can you kind of walk us through the selection process of the people that show at Untitled? Are there galleries that have been with you since the very beginning? Obviously, you know, there's always like new ones coming in. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process? Absolutely. So we have, um, again, unique to Untitled, there are like different ways of putting together selection committees. In our case, we work with an artistic director. I'm also part of the curatorial committee. And as I said, this year we are inviting guest curators. Um, the selection process, Miami is a very competitive uh, um, like moment of the year. And mm -hmm. of course we have like, we received many, uh, many submissions from galleries. We always uh, try to find the right balance between uh, long-standing exhibitors, but also making sure that we are supporting and welcoming um, galleries from other cities. So that's like, it's a big responsibility to me, like, um, People from my team, they say, well, now is the moment to enjoy the process. And definitely it's a, it's a great, like, being part of the curatorial decisions and, and having those conversations about art yeah. and proposals. But also it's a big responsibility. And sometimes we, we, need, we need and we want to make risks. We want to also welcome galleries from elsewhere, from Central America has been like an important focus of ours, uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, South America, again, this year, Asia, but Asia at large. Asia, when we talk about Asia or we, we talk about the East, we are talking about Eastern Europe, Middle East, Asian diaspora, Asia Pacific. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a very interesting uh, um, selection process that we, we it's like takes time, takes many hours, takes a lot of research, uh, but um, definitely, the goal is always to try to be, to keep a good balance between galleries that we've been working for a long time, but also welcoming yep. new voices and new, new initiatives that are entitled. And also not only galleries, we, we work with nonprofits, mm -hmm. artists run spaces. Um, definitely there is no need for us to be looking at galleries that, you know, have certain shows per year or that they have a physical location because the art world is shifting. Yes. It's not the rules, and there are new rules to play the, the game. And I think that also is very important for us as art fairs organizers to, to understand what is the role of the art fair and how we also need to evolve mm -hmm. and adapt uh, to these new, new initiatives, new projects and new spaces. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's a point that I really wanted to touch on as well. Um, the art world is shifting. I've seen a lot of changes. A lot of galleries don't no longer have physical spaces. They're kind of like on the go galleries with like pop-up locations and things like that. Um, our fairs are really changing. Um, you know, there's like the huge conglomerate fairs like Art Basel and Freeze. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask you what your take is for the future of art fairs in the art industry. This is a, <laughs> yeah, that's a this big is one. a difficult yeah. question. No, I mean definitely this is something that I you know I we continuously are working on and, and think how we can be 
uh, how, how can we adapt? How can we better support our galleries, our dealers, our artists, um, all the art players that you know help support uh, and are part of, of the art fair ecosystem? A couple of things here. I would try to organize my thoughts. The first one, I would say that uh, in the current global economical, economic downturn, yep. whether this is a cyclical cycle of the economy that we all know, whether this is a more seismic-like situation for the art world, that is to be seen. However, I feel very uh, positive towards, you know, again, we were just talking about the Armory Week and, and I'm, I feel very positive about Miami. Let's don't forget that Miami Art Week is the most important uh, moment for art fairs in the US and the US is the, the biggest, right, center for, for, I mean, the biggest um, center for our world for their world. Um, and I would say that definitely um, audience development is something that we are like, we need to continuously be looking at. Uh, how can we keep engaging, not only with our current visitors, VIP guests, institutions, press, galleries, of course, artists, but also young collectors. Mm -hmm. And how are we like engaging with a new generation uh, of people that potentially are not very familiar with what we are doing. There is a lot of interest, but definitely I feel that there is a gap here and we need to continuously create ways of minding that gap. Actually, uh, one of the year-round programming this year in Miami, in a couple of weeks' time, will be revolving. The, 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 the panel discussion will be revolving exactly about that. Uh, kind of nurturing and creating the collector of the future and help them understand our language. Because sometimes, you know, I also need to take this as an art professional, it's our responsibility, how we are communicating with these audiences and how um, welcome they feel when they come to an art fair. Yeah. The second uh, biggest um, goal for, for me as executive director at Untitled and for our teams are, of course, the digital realm. How we can uh, be um, incorporating technology uh, in order to continue with that accessible approach, becoming like more international, uh, becoming more diverse, uh, helping uh, support uh, our exhibitors beyond that physical presence. That being said, this is a people's business. Yes. And this is a very social event. And we have a physical fair. So it's always a very, um, very important to find the right balance where we continue giving attention to our physical event, but we also can expand that physical event beyond Miami Art Week and beyond the week of the fair to reach uh, new audiences. We've been putting big efforts on that, on the technological, digital side of things. Uh, we actually were the first ones launching a virtual fair during the pandemic. Uh, of course, that continued with an OBR, as everyone did. Uh, we've been working closely, of course, with our long-standing partner, Artsy. Uh, we work with Bortic uh, on digital exhibitions and virtual reality exhibitions to expand uh, the reach and to help also our exhibitors to connect with those new audiences. This year, is, is, we are putting together a very interesting show, which will be curated by the two guest curators, and it will be highlights of is within the East Miss West kind of theme uh, by creating a digital exhibition. Uh, so it's not only what you are going to be seeing at Untitled this December, but also what it can be uh, seen uh, in the digital realm, uh, which I think that, again, you know, not that many people can travel to Miami for the show. Uh, also, it's like, you know, there is so many troubles that you can make. There are people that, you know, in terms of, again, as I was saying, accessibility and technology is key to support that accessibility and making the art world more accessible. So yeah, digital uh, technology and how we 
bridge those and create that gap uh, that title is essential. And of course, um, I mean, grow. Uh, the growth and expansion of the fair is also, you know, of critical importance uh, for, for the team. Uh, we are now, as I mentioned, we are moving and expanding to a new location. So this is also very important. At the end of the day, this is a business, right? Yeah. And, and the business needs to grow, but also it needs to grow in a sustainable way. Uh, and keeping and, and continuing with that curatorial integrity, but also continuously looking into options on how we can better support our galleries and artists. Yeah, I'm glad that you also touched on cultivating the new generation of collectors, which is really key. Um, as you know, many galleries are now looking to secession plans. Obviously, the big players um, are kind of thinking about their future and what that's going to look like once you know the major art dealers either retire or are no longer with us. Um, and with that, you know, also comes a new generation of collector into the gallery. So I'm glad that you touched on that because it's also an important key for our fairs as well. Yeah, absolutely. And again, how do we evolve? And, you know, what is the role of the art fair? And also, I mean, in this case, of course, particularly to Untitled uh, and how we kind of be always uh, uh, continuously being innovative uh, uh, and also evolving, you know, and, and taking into account. I think that listening to our dealers, to our galleries, to our cultural partners, to uh, all, I mean, again, all the, the players involved is key in, you know, the direction that, that of that development and of that growth. Yeah. And I also wanted to ask you, what is a major goal that you want to accomplish with Untitled as acting executive director? Um... Another big one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that, which is, again, back to this previous question, it would be like, you know, a sustainable growth. Mm -hmm. I think that I do want to see the fair growing, uh, like with not only one location or two locations, but even more potentially, you know, like looking into an international expansion when the time comes. Um, also, our messaging, I mean, is is. It is, it is um, very important to me, all the efforts that the team are putting towards the curatorial integrity, towards like bringing more voices to the art world. Not only be looking at the same galleries or the same artists or the same centers, it is essential. And I want to make sure that people um, are getting this message and I understand that this is what makes Untitled unique. This is what makes Untitled uh, different to others. Uh, we were talking about Untitled Art Podcast. Mm -hmm. Last year we put together 19 panel discussions during Miami Art Week. A little bit challenging. Yes. I mean, I have to say, I mean, and you know this <laughs> yes. uh, by doing the art pod, but, uh, but this is important. It's important. This is the moment of the year to give visibility to crucial key issues in our industry. Let's do it. Let's, let's, let's talk about those. And let's also find a collaborative option and ways of, of changing and growing uh, together. Also performance. I mean, performances are very key to the nature also of the fair. Last year, we organized 10 performances. At you were fair. so ambitious. 19 it was a, it was a little bit ambitious. It was great. I mean, of course, some dealers, you know, were looking at me saying like, Clara, what is this? Yeah. Well, this is a performance. It's, you know, 30 minutes. Like, it's very important as well, you know, also to be looking and supporting non-commercial art practices. Not all the art is for sale in a traditional way, mm -hmm. right? So how can we, how within the art fair ecosystem and platform can also give voice to, again, as I was saying, artists running spaces, uh, performance art, nonprofit organizations, residency programs. And I think that we've been doing a great job towards emphasizing those. So, so yeah. Yeah, I'm glad that you actually included, because I did notice that about um, that Untitled included the performance pieces, uh, which I found really incredible because it's not a lot of fairs no. I know actually spotlight that. Um, and it's interesting because I was actually having a conversation yesterday with an artist about performance art and 
how do we shine a spotlight on a performance if you can't attend it in person? Like, how do we continue the longevity of a piece and things like that? Um, so I feel like supporting performance artists is, is also incredibly critical because it's like you mentioned, it's not a traditional sort of medium, but it is a very important one. Correct. Exactly. And again, you know, also for us, in terms of the curatorial selection, back to your yeah. question, is always looking not only at the traditional media. Yeah. It's like being more experimental, looking at conceptual art, looking at performance art, digital art. Last year, with the curatorial theme of creating in the, in the, in the digital age, it was very interesting to see and to welcome galleries that are working with AI with mm -hmm. uh, generative art, with other ways of doing. Again, NFTs is up for debate, but it is a new medium. Yeah. And we need to be looking also at those. Yeah, and, and I'm glad that you are because you're very ambitious and innovative in that sense because art will look very different than it does now in 20, 30, 50 years and much more in 200 years uh, as we can like look back 200 years ago, what it looked like and what it looks like now. So, you know, I think being innovative and thinking towards the future is key in, you know, having a sustainable art fair. And I think Untitled is doing that, which is really great. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what does an executive director at an art fair do? <laughs> Besides everything. <laughs> Wearing many hats. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, I'm going to start this question. I think that is helpful to also give a little bit of context on the departments mm -hmm. within an art fair. Because at the end of the day, um, it takes a lot to put an art fair together. There are many departments that need to be like, you know, in direct conversation. It's not only about the exhibitor relations side of things or communications, but also operations and production. Also marketing, uh, press, sponsorship is now also playing an important role. Uh, design team. So definitely BAP relations, of course, it is key BAP and institutional relations to make sure that we uh, are attracting the right audience and continuously updating our database to make sure that uh, uh, the right people also like, you know, attend the fair also. Um, so basically, I need to make sure and that all these departments are speaking to each other, are in direct conversation. Uh, these are not like um, separate departments. These are like departments that are always working together. Of course, I want to be a supportive leader and manager, helping my team with all the concerns. Also, we are very much well known for being thinking outside of the box. So being uh, open to new ideas uh, and not shutting down. Oh no, this is not for us. Mm -hmm. or like, you know, this is definitely, I'm very like open to be listening at what our teams think on what we can do to continue evolving and growing the title brand. So it takes a lot. Um, I love what I do. I think we have a very strong team um, and, and definitely, you know, coordinating all these different departments, supporting all these different departments um, and, and making sure that they have the right tools in place to, to achieve their goals and, you know, each strategy for every given year. Yeah. So as we know, Untitled happens at the end of the year in December. Um, how does the cycle of working on the art fair begin for you? So how does a year kind of, when do you start planning and all of that stuff? So this is something very interesting that many people ask me, but do you work all year yeah. for a one week event? It's like, uh, yeah, yeah, we actually do. <laughs> uh, much more. I mean, uh, we started strategizing, I mean, the 2025 edition, it's already like, you know, we already are in conversation about what is next. Mm -hmm. um, the planning it takes in terms of the curatorial strategy and what would be the curatorial theme for each given year. It is something that it starts pretty much after we put out the applications for, uh, for the current year edition. Um, we and work when do the galleries start applying? In February, end of February, beginning of March. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it is um, something that we start, it's like different phases, right? So we start first with the applications, then of course comes the, the, 
uh, programming, development, BAP side of things is something important that we, we definitely start working at a very early stage. And now with this year, and also like planning on another edition, we are working with two, like uh, in two different projects. That being said, year-round programming is also an important part of the fair and uh, of my efforts as the executive director. So we also organize year-round programming. Mm -hmm. uh, we started in June this year in Mallorca, Spain. Our year-round programming is, uh, we work with uh, our cultural and prize partners and programming partners. So we went to Mallorca and the, the VAP weekend was revolving around a prize partner. It's called the CCA Andrax in, in Andrax, Mallorca, Spain, a superb, very strong international residency program. Uh, we work with them and put together a prize. So the, the prize recipient, the winner was in June, uh, welcome to the residency in June, and we organize a VAP weekend revolving around the prize. We also definitely very much look at Miami and Miami Beach for year-round programming. We organize several panel discussions in Miami to start looking, it's not only about us coming for one week, but also making sure that we are engaging and supporting the Miami area community year-round. This year we are also organizing programming in New Haven, thanks to Next Haven, the residency okay. program. We also had a programming collaboration with them with a prize, uh, residency prize last year on title. The artists will be uh, doing, uh, taking part of the residency September and October, and we're organizing our VAP weekend in October. And again, this can go on. I mean, we, we are constantly organizing events, programming. So definitely it's not only looking at the Miami Beach edition, but the Miami Beach edition within the year round programming. Mm -hmm. But definitely it takes, it takes a full year, if not two full years to yeah. put together one, one event. And then of course in September, this is when we are starting securing all the programming, the VAP events, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to start like looking into the on-site event. What are we doing in terms of activations, special projects is also a key component of Untitled. All these um, activations that happen outside of the, of the booths, right? Um, the programming of performances and title our podcast. So it takes its different phases, uh, but it can, it takes, yeah. And it's when do you year. tell the galleries that they've been accepted? Um, mid August to okay. beginning of September. It, okay. it changed from year to year. We, we announced our exhibitor list in August 27th this year. And on title is based, like the headquarters is based in New York. Well, our team, the core of the team is in New York. Okay. Uh, and then we have many teams members in between Miami and New York, and also other team members located outside of, outside of the New York or Miami area. Um, I mean, with COVID, do I always say, even as an art professional, you don't really need to be in New York yes. much. We travel a lot, uh, but definitely the core of the team is in New York City. Yeah, I think COVID restructured everyone's thinking on how roles can be performed. Hence, you know, more work from home, hybrid. Um, you don't really need to be, as long as you have access to Wi-Fi, I feel like you can I do mean, anything. I mean, welcome to the Zoom era or the Teams era, right? Exactly. Like, yeah, everything is on Zoom on Teams, which is, again, great towards accessibility. Yeah. And great towards being able to work with great teams that are in base. In, in New York yeah. or in Miami. Yeah, and the art world is international, so technology brings us together in that sense. This was a little bit, if I may say, yeah. a little bit of a challenge this year when I, when, you know, when we decided on, firmly decide on the curatorial theme of East Miss West, because that means that all my meetings were at seven in the oh, morning. Oh yeah, the time difference be, is crazy. In order to be able to connect with, you know, Tokyo, Singapore, yeah. Ho Chi Minh, uh, Hong Kong, it was like, but it was, yeah, it was great. It's like, it's a good reason to be wake up early. Yeah, before. yeah, yeah. I, I always forget that um, the time difference in Asia is so different from oh our East Coast one. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of used to it yeah. because, you know, my family's in Spain, so it's six hours. Yeah. Uh, they are six hours ahead of us. But, you know, like with, with, with Asia, I mean, with certain parts of Asia, it's yeah. like nine. Yeah, or 10 exactly. Hours, so it's like, yeah. it's a lot. 
I remember now my team, well, part of my team is in Seoul in Korea for a freeze. Mm. And when we're talking, I, I'm i always like, okay, what what day is it there? What time is it there? Um, so yeah, it's, it's you're right. Something to navigate is definitely time differences. <laughs> um, so I also wanted to ask you, what is your kind of favorite aspect of your job? We deal with art. Yeah. And that is beautiful. I mean, the conversations that we are having about uh, how can we explore a specific project at Untitled, uh, um, working and communicating with galleries, with artists, with curators, with advisors, with collectors. That is like something that, you know, it doesn't happen in many industries. I always talk with my friends that they say, or like, I'm complaining one day of, oh my gosh, I'm so... I'm exhausted, right, of all this traveling. And mm. then, of course, the, the, they say to me, well, at least you travel, yeah. right? We travel, we discover, we learn, we constantly learn. Um, so this is something, you know, being surrounded by creative people, uh, I think that is, yeah, is one of the most rewarding parts of, of, of this, of the role, and being working as an executive director at an art fair. So on the flip side, what's the most challenging aspect? I have a long list. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> that I can start with. Uh, the first one, um, I would say that, I mean, it's, this is a challenging time for the industry. Mm -hmm. And definitely I'm not having, I mean, it's, we are having difficult conversations with galleries. And it's, it's sad. And you want to understand how we can better support them. Uh, in order, you know, to have a very successful participation at Untitled at the fair. Um, this is, is, is not easy. Uh, but again, I feel very positive that this is just a moment. And it makes sense within the economic cycle. I think that's something that, I mean, I promise myself not to be very controversial. Everyone that knows me uh, knows that I tend to be very honest. Yeah. Even my brother says, Clara, sometimes you don't need to say everything what you, that you think, right? <laughs> But uh, I appreciate honesty. Yeah, well, that's, I'm that's gonna how do we, it. I'm yeah. gonna go all on. Um, so, over the past years, since I started my professional career, I, I've been noticing that unfortunately, um, this industry sometimes is about everything but art. Yes, and I think that is very important to remind ourselves that we are here thanks to the artists and the galleries that support those artists, and the collectors that support those artists' work, institutions, creators, press, again, every art player involved. So I think that it's important, you know, to us to reflect and not, for, not to forget that, you know, art, this is a, an art business, so it is um, critical to find the right balance also within the art fair ecosystem and perspective of that institutional and cultural level with commerce and with business. We are here to sell art. This is a, the art fairs are a key platform for galleries to sell art, to expand the network. Uh, uh, however, it's also very important to, to, to take art into consideration and not to forget uh, the, the, the importance and the responsibility that we have you know, towards our history and the development of like a more sustainable contemporary art world. Yeah. That's definitely key. Competition is, is something that I face. Uh, um, I would love to see more. I, and I want to be like, you know, I don't want to be like in the pessimistic approach of things. I want to be like always thinking about, you know, realizing and noticing what, what can be, what can we do to support like what I feel that they are like the challenges in the industry, but I would love to see much more collaborative initiatives, not only at a gallery level, which I think that we are seeing many more than yes. we used to see in the past in terms of co-representation of artists, in terms of joint booths at first in terms of you know many like you know many spaces in new york that welcome galleries um 
um, every month and you know again like different models in terms of, of art platforms but also in terms of art fairs and how we can all collaborate together at the end of the day I always say this is a very Spanish way of saying that we are all in the same boat which is art and culture mm -hmm. so I think that competition is good it's good and it's healthy but it can be uh, but it can we can find like ways of like you know while being different art fair uh, having like different sorry having like different art fair um, structures and, and and ideas right and businesses to try to see how we can work together more in being like you know supporting all the players yeah uh, i'm glad that you actually brought that up because that's that, that's really important um but also i was thinking about this the other day there's like hundreds of art fairs happening all year round everywhere there's a ton of competition obviously there are more seasoned art fairs like you know untitled art basel armory freeze like all those things but there's also like smaller ones popping up across asia or even like in turkey in ibiza um so it's like how do galleries begin to think like where do we show like, it that's is the big thing now. It is. It is. I mean, again, there are like major cities, major art fair cities and centers. Mm -hmm. Again, Miami is one of those. Uh, so I think that, again, that would be a question that would be better answered by a gallery yeah. on what is their strategy. I feel that definitely what we are seeing here is like galleries carefully selecting which markets are uh, the key markets for for them in order to uh, you know uh, to 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 place and, and, and make sure that uh, they continue with the gallery strategy um, and expanding that reach. Um, it is true to say that there are many art fairs, but that if there are many art fairs, is because art fairs work. Yeah. Again, going back to many articles that we are writing lately and actually like a, a question that I also wanted to share with uh, with in Instagram yesterday in terms of you know what is the role of the art fair mm -hmm. uh, are art fairs still relevant well by seeing all these art fairs like you know mastering through the different cities it shows that it's like a very important uh, platform for galleries and for artists, and again, for everyone involved in, the, in, in this industry. However, it's true to say that, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are like uh, a special, uh, well, there is like, dealers need to be carefully selecting which art fairs work for them. Yeah. Again, with Miami, we, we work with a very kind of established platform and city. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge event, as we know. I think mm -hmm. that is like, what this year will be like 20 art fairs taking place within one week. Exactly. But I also like to see, you know, what is the, the effect of art fairs to all these cities, you know, to like an art fair in Madrid or an art fair in Turkey, as you mentioned, or like, you know, and different options and um, ideas and a little bit more like artist run events, kind of exhibition like the Basel Social Club or... Mm -hmm. Uh, other type of events like that happened this year in Seoul, like following the same model of the Basel Social Club, more in instead of like closed booths, having this idea of like an open exhibition where like galleries have their own voice and a space, but it feels more like as a curated show rather than, you know, booths, yeah. work, work booths. Yeah. Um, and then I was like also thinking about the fact that, you know, our fairs are a great way to bring a whole bunch of collectors into one space um, where other galleries can also kind of, you know, tap into the network of collectors at a different gallery because now they're showing in one space. So everyone kind of converges in this one area. Um, and, you know, collectors obviously live all around the world. Artists live all around the world. So art fairs essentially become this focal point where you can have access to all these individuals in one given space of time, which is, I think, really key to you know, meeting new people? I mean, yeah. First of all, selling that commercial value that has an art fair is there. I mean, galleries and artists need to sell. Networking is key 
is the moment where you meet with your peers, with yep. other galleries. Uh, of course, like, you know, you give visibility to your program, uh, and it, but not only to in order to sell or to position ex artists into an institutional collection or an institutional show, uh, but also like meeting other galleries and potentially creating synergies and sharing and discovering a new artist and bringing that artist and collaborating in a show or collaborating in an upcoming art fair with a booth. So I think that all these synergies that happen at art fairs are essential. It is, uh, it is not only about that selling component, but also about that networking component and also about discovery art. Yes. Like, you know, it's a great moment to discover for many, like, you know, many new positions that they weren't aware of. In this year's case, it will be like for many, a great opportunity to discover like, you know, art from regions that they are not generally familiar with because for many of these exhi well, the exhibitors this year coming from Asia is their first international art fair participation. I mean, we have, galleries coming from you know uh, from all these regions uh, and also I think that is very important to me this idea this like is a diff different aesthetic mm -hmm. which also we need to recognize it's not about creating like an exotic view on these regions but also making sure that we all share this responsibility of that you know we are welcoming and we should continuously welcoming other type of voices, other ways of approaching and understanding contemporary art and, and practicing contemporary art. Yeah, I completely agree. And I love, I mean, for me personally, I love going to offers because that's a chance for me to discover new artists because I don't have time to sit on every single gallery's website page and see what exhibitions are coming up, who's on their roster and offers are a quick way for me to be like, oh, that artist is really interesting or who's representing this person. Um, and I love that about art fairs. Uh, it saves me a lot of time. <laughs> and also educating yes. is a part. I mean, we were talking uh, about like, you know, audience development, younger generations of people that are interested in what we are doing. And it's a great moment, again, through the Untitled Art Podcast on site or like through year-round events to continuously educate, you know, on what we are doing, why we are doing this and why art, contemporary art, these artists, these galleries, these themes are important to the development, not only to contemporary art, but also to, to societies. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for talking about that because this was a great conversation. You're my first art fair guest. Um, and for all my listeners, um, if you're heading down to Miami this year, check out Untitled. Please, we'll see you there. Yes. Uh, I'm excited <laughs> to see how everything goes this year, um, at, during our Basel week, um, for everybody. Um, so now I want to go back <laughs> in, in, to your past and start with kind of your um, studies uh, to backtrack to the very, very beginning. Um, you studied art history and contemporary art at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. Yeah. And then you completed programs at the University of Deusto and then the program with NYU Guggenheim Bilbao in visual arts and management. And you studied in Florence. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how your education reinforced kind of what you ended up doing, which sure. is being the executive director? So I study art history. Uh, so definitely that, that gave me like a uh, great foundations no? on, 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 on art, uh, the traditional aspect and side of, of, of art, um, which, um, I've been like then growing into the different like programs that I talk I did an Erasmus in Florence, in Italy. Um, I did the executive program with uh, the NYU uh, Deusto and the Guggenheim of Bilbao. Um, and all this, I feel that I'm coming from an art history, uh, art history background. So at the end of the day, you know, um, that uh, we were talking about, like, you know, the, the, the foundation on what we do, which mm -hmm. to me, is art. Yes. Um, and I feel that this gave me like definitely the, a, a great and deep understanding on, on uh, art history, art from every different like, you know, 
moment of, 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 of history and different countries as well. In Spain, it's a five-year degree university. Mm -hmm. So um, you really go deep in like, you know, all the different like, you know, faces uh, and movements of art. Contemporary art wasn't like, you know, uh, I mean, it was last year, I think, uh, the last year of university, and I think that we ended up in Andy Warhol. Okay. <laughs> not because, you know, there was no interest in contemporary art in, in the university, the Spanish university. However, you know, they are like very kind of theor theory based mm -hmm. kind of programs that, you know, like very much get into like all from literature to history to art to also like you know curatorial and, and technique side of things um, so this has been essential in what I do this kind of my, my degree gave me the right tools uh, to feel very confident on taking on this um, uh, responsibility uh, as the executive director of, of an art fair uh, definitely that has been, I mean, I've been very curious and continuously working and, 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 and expanding on my studies, uh, getting a little bit that more side, I mean, business side mm -hmm. uh, or technical side of things. Uh, also starting to, the, the, the program that was in between Bilbao and New York started to help me as well to get like more, familiarize myself more uh, with the U.S. institutions, like, you know, movements, techniques. Uh, so that has been key, I mean, to, to, to the development of my career. I, from, from Madrid, I moved right to London. Yes. I am a very energetic, kind of passionate person, um, super active, a little bit sometimes too active. <laughs> and, you know, to me, I didn't see myself like, as, uh, like a researcher on like, you know, more like traditional uh, uh, part of the, art, of the of the of the art history, right uh, side of things, but very much interested in that the dynamic, the ultra contemporary, and how I could support and better support like you know emerging artists. So that's why I decided to move to London. I started my professional career uh, with an internship at, at Patrick Heide, which I still need to thank Patrick for that <laughs> opportunity. Something very interesting, fun fact here, which was, I mean, of course, uh, you know, I was an Spaniard going to, to, to London um, from, a, I'm coming from a small city in the northwest of Spain, it's called Vigo, which is very close to the border with, with Portugal. And I will like connect that with like, you know, another position that I had in a gallery in Portugal. And I very much remember, you know, arriving to that gallery. I, what I did in terms of, you know, I think that this will help also the audience, uh, the, you know, the people that might be listening to us on like, how did she did it? Or like, how do you start doing this? Yeah. Well, I moved to London and I said, okay, let me like, you know, look around and see which galleries are looking for internships, right? So I was like a couple of, I had a couple of options, a couple of interviews. I arrived to this gallery. They were looking for a German speaker intern, right? And, and I arrived there and I, the gallery director at the time interviewed me, Martina. I will remember this moment forever. And I think that this is a good learning experience. Yeah. She said, uh, well, you know, great meeting you. Let me introduce you to the director. Then the director came, Patrick, and he, she said to him, well, she doesn't speak German. And actually her English is not very good. <laughs> so he looked at me, he took out the glasses and he said, well, let's give it a try. I think that, you know, you had like the right energy and the right vibe. So that being said, you know, if I wouldn't be pushing myself and going to or applying to that, you know, interview, sending that email out of the blue, uh, you know, because I don't speak German, you know, I wouldn't be potentially what I am, mm -hmm. what I'm today. So I think that it's very important as well, you know, to move outside of your comfort zone, believe in what you are and what you do. That's how it started. I started as a gallery intern. I think that many of our colleagues in this industry, that's how they started. Yeah. From the gallery intern, I got promoted to a gallery director position. I stayed in London for four years. I did everything. And at a small gallery, we do everything. We do the walls, 
We prepared the, uh, you know, we prepared all the materials, all the art for applications. I was very involved in the programming, very involved in the artist selection, uh, all the initiatives. So it has been a great learning experience. So it's not only my background uh, as a foundation, no, uh, of who I am today and, and the professional that I am today, but also all the experiences that I've been like, you know, taking on my career and having towards like, you know, learning all the needies and greedies of their world. And definitely I think that this is essential as well as, you know, arriving um, to an art fair, first like as a part-time in, in the VAP uh, department, and then we're now as, you know, in other director positions, and now as an executive director, but also coming from the gallery world, a small galleries, yeah. right? Because I know, very much know what a gallery needs. Yeah. And that's, you know, I'm always looking into how I can better support those galleries. So, so yeah, that's a little bit the story on yeah. how I just started. I mean, I can relate <laughs> because one of my first like big jobs out of school was working for a small gallery and I was the director of like public relations, but I was still patching walls when we were like doing yeah, installations, exactly. like with the preparators. And, you know, I loved it because I learned so many skills and so many things that I then took on to like my larger roles. Like I knew how installations work, like what the schedule would have been like and things like that. You learn, you learn very invaluable skills when you have hands-on experience like that working for a small space. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but it was definitely like a difference in culture coming from Spain to the UK. Yeah, very much. And a big challenge. I mean, I think that's something that is a challenge to me. Uh, it is, you know, at the end of the day, English is my second language. Mm -hmm. So it's always like very important. And I don't, I mean, I'm an Spaniard, but I feel that this is like a share concern and challenge for many, you know, that yeah. they are not, they haven't like grew up or studied in the US or in London in this case. To me, it was my moment to expand. I mean, of course, London was, you know, the cultural capital yeah. of Western Europe. It was definitely, you know, the commercial capital of Western Europe. And I knew that I wanted to work for within the art world at the kind of more like, you know, gallery art fair level. Less, I was always less interested in like auction houses or the museum. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's because it doesn't, uh, do, I mean, I'm basically more interested in like that part of like the, the actual direct connection with the artists and help support and create those markets and help them, you know, towards like having the first gallery show and like, you know, supporting them in their concerns at their, in their practice. I mean, I go to many studios and they ask me, what do you think about the work? And what do you think that is missing? So that's very much, you know, yeah, a passion of mine. Yeah. So then after that, um, you went to Portugal. I did move to Portugal. <laughs> yes. Um, you became the assistant director at Galeria Mar Mario Sequeira. Sequeira. Yes, yeah, Sequeira. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what made you want to move to Portugal and take so, on that position? Again, I mean, London was great. Yeah. Um, I owed a lot to London. However, after four years, um, I'm a very ambitious person. Sometimes, you know, I was yesterday listening to a very interesting podcast of a very well-known dealer that just stepped down out of, you know, the, the, the gallery that he founded. And he actually asked himself and to the audience, you know, when is enough? Which I think that is also something that, you know, we need to be, or myself, you know, I reflect a lot on like, what if, uh, when is enough? So to me, at that time, London wasn't enough. I wanted okay. more. I keep a great relationship with, you know, with the, the gallery and, and, and the founder and director with Patrick. But I wanted a, a new challenge. You know, I wanted to continue like growing at a personal and professional level. At that time, uh, Arco, which is the biggest art fair in Spain, was opening a second edition of the fair in Lisbon. As I mentioned, I am uh, I'm from Galicia, which I live, I mean, I grew up 20 minutes with the board, from the border with Portugal, so very close. Mm -hmm. We have also an own language, which is Galician. So um, I speak Portuguese. Well, for many of our my Portuguese friends, they would say that I speak Portuñol, which is a mix between <laughs> Spanish and Portugal and Portuguese. And then I said, listen, this is a great opportunity to see, you know, to go. I think that this is a very exciting project. It was in Lisbon. So what I did, again, very much Clara being Clara, like, you know, okay, let's move back home, 
because I wanted to establish a base there. And I decided to travel to the key cities in Portugal, which are Lisbon and Porto, mm -hmm. and starting to gather feedback, you know, galleries that I knew, galleries that I just show up at the gallery asking, you know, for advice. Listen, I'm coming from London. I'm very much interested in like, you know, the Portuguese scene um, and how I can help and better support. Um, and then one of those galleries that I went visit was uh, Mario Sequeira in Portugal, in Braga, which is 40 kilometers north from Porto. Uh, and actually the gallery is not even in Porto. It's like in a little village called uh, Parada de Tivais. Mm -hmm. So um, I went there, I was speaking with Mario and I said, I'm interested in, you know, what is happening in the Portuguese scene. I'm coming with this, uh, like, you know, knowledge of four years being in London. Um, so what, what is your advice? And he said, I love your profile. You have a very international profile. Why don't you stay here with me? I'm trying to, you know, move the gallery into a new direction, a more emerging direction. So I said, okay, let's do it. So I am also very thankful for the opportunity. It was a great opportunity for me. Um, at that time, also it was a gallery uh, that was dealing more at a blue chip level. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very well known dealer in Portugal, so I learned. I got to learn like other aspects, right, from the from uh, from the industry. I worked with top artists: uh, Andre Butzer, Solo Show, Eva Rocha in in, in Braga, uh, Joan Capote, the the Cuban artist in Braga. So that was great for me. Um, and yeah, it was it was a, a, a great experience, a totally different experience. However, of course, I was coming from London, so at some point, uh, a very dear friend of mine, which is actually from Vigo, but he lives in LA, and I always say this. He said to me, "Listen, you need to come to the US. You know, you have the right energy, you have like the right knowledge, and I think that the US is for you." And I said, oh, okay, <laughs> let me see what, you know, like, okay. And somehow I was never thinking about the U.S. I was always been very motivated on how I can support the contemporary art scene in Spain, which I think that, you know, there is a lot still to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, I sent a couple of emails, you know, out of the blue to some people that I knew that had connections or galleries. And one of them replied the next day and say, yes, sure, in New York City with me. And this is how it started the kind of, you know, from Portugal, the transition to New York. And seven years later, here I am. So that's when you applied to Pablo's birthday. Well, I didn't really apply. I okay. sent an email to, to Arnie okay. and said, I hope that you remember me. Uh, he's a very close friend of Patrick, so that was like definitely a connection there. I've done a lot of fairs, I mean, with him. Mm -hmm. uh, he was coming from the US, Patrick, I mean, of course, we were coming from London and lots of, you know, moments for us to share, to talk about the US, London. We share a couple of artists at that time. So yeah, he said, yes, sure, in New York. It wasn't an easy one because of course, definitely, you know, the visa situation is always there. Uh, but yeah, I made it happen. So we made it happen. So I wanted also, because I'm glad that you brought up the visa situation, because some of my guests before have had dual citizenship. So for them, it was, you know, a lot easier to move to the U.S., but there is the aspect of the visa. So how did you do that? There is the drama of the visa. Oh, I the think that yes. many people, you know, well, you believe in yourself, you make it happen. You know, there are many options in terms of visa. In, in visa, I mean, it's not, I would say that this, it wasn't easy, but it's doable. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, um, that's definitely not my case. I wasn't, I don't have a dual citizenship. Uh, uh, so definitely the visa was very much part of the equation. And I feel that it's very much, you know, a concern of many international professionals that would love to try, you know, to have a, a work experience in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so then you were at the gallery director of Pablo's birthday for quite some time. You were there for like five years. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your role there? Yeah, sure. I mean, I came to the gallery also at that time. Uh, he wanted to continue to grow the gallery program. He had a very much emphasis in the program in European artists, minimal art and abstraction. So um, I was working with him, Hanon Hans, on like how we can 
how we could continue growing that program in terms of new artists' representation, in terms of new art fair participation. So it was great, a great also learning experience. It helped me a lot as well to get to to know, you know, the US market. I mean, you know, yes. I was knowing the US market from the other side of the coin. So very essential for me to start like, you know, understanding who are the key players in the city, you know, uh, mm, which are the neighborhoods, you know, what is trendy, what is not, you know, what in the institutions, I mean, all the um, collectors, curators that I should be knowing and getting to know better. Mm -hmm. So that was great. We were in the Lower East Side for five years and then we moved to Tribeca. Mm. And at that time, I also, I mean, I started since the very beginning that I moved to the U.S., I started collaborating also with Untitled. I started yes. part-time in at Untitled. It was a lot. It was a 24-7, yeah. seven days a week. But this is what it takes. I mean, again, you know, like many people is, oh my gosh, I don't know how you did it. Well, working. That's how I did it. Working, believing in myself, thinking that, you know, the sky is the limit. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not from the U.S. Um, you know, again, English is my second language, but you can make it happen. If you have, you know, the right knowledge, if you are willing to work hard, which I think that is something, you know, that, and if you're ambitious. So definitely, yeah, definitely. It was a little bit challenging to combine all the positions, but it was very interesting because it was giving me a 360 degree mm -hmm. approach. No, into what I wanted to do by getting, like, you know, growing within the Untitled team and having the opportunity uh, that they gave me to grow internally, you know, I very much came to the realization that I like the art fair ecosystem. That is very much for me. This is very funny also from this podcast. This dealer was saying that I don't love selling art. <laughs> I didn't like selling art. Yeah. Is not, I mean, of course, I was like, you know, a very successful sales person, but I do think that, you know, to me, it's very interesting to be, to keep that, um, this strategy, development, programming side of things, the curatorial, the connection with galleries, with artists, that is, yeah, that are my key strengths. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the selling part of art, um, which is, I mean, I've obviously worked on the gallery side early in my career and now I'm back in the gallery aspect. But for me, I also, I was like, I could never see myself in sales because like, I don't really treat art as like a commodity. For me, it's like something else. Obviously, like we need to support these artists. So we yeah. do need to sell their works. That is literally critical to their livelihood. Um, so it's very important. But, you know, that's also something that I want to use this platform for is to show that you don't need to necessarily do sales to be in the art industry. Like there are various other aspects where you can enter and, and you know, be happy with. Absolutely. Um, but I also wanted to ask you, because while you were at Pablo's birthday, as the gallery director, you were also, you started out Untitled as, I think, the VIP relations person for mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. How did you manage to secure that role? while you were also the gallery director of Pablo's birthday? Like, did you apply? Did you know somebody? No, I, I applied. Okay. I applied to a position, to an open position, and that's how I started. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't coming from a BAP side of things, yeah. so I was, it was a great learning experience. I learned a lot. I'm very thankful to my manager at the time, first of all, to give me the opportunity, and, thank, and, and second, because she... She, yeah, she educated me. She helped me very much to learn, uh, you know, um, all the in and outs on like, you know, the VAP department, relations side and development and programming side of things. I learned a lot. And that's how, yeah, that's how it was. I didn't know anyone. I mean, I'm, yeah. So besides that, <laughs> in the second like half of, you know, your job at Pablo's, while you're also doing the VIP relations at Untitled, you also started La Pera Project. Yeah. <laughs> you're uh, like, two wasn't enough. I need a third job. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about La Pera Project? Sure. I mean, it's not that, you know, two were enough. Actually, yeah. there were more than enough. Oh. You know, I could yeah. like, I'm very happy that now I'm like solely focused on one yeah. thing. Uh, that I love, uh, but it was, um, it is, I feel, as I was saying, like very responsible to art, to artists and to galleries. And I was feeling, you know, that something was off. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, very much connected to what I said on like, you know, this is about everything but art. I mean, what is happening and how yeah. I can, how can I contribute in my own way, you know, to change things. Don't get me wrong. I was very happy at both organizations. Uh, and I, I feel that both organizations are also very responsible, I mean, uh, and, 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 and keen to, to, to contribute to make and support the industry at another capacity. Uh, however, I was feeling like, you know, many things here in order to establish and think and, 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 and create this project. The first one, this gap that I feel that is going, like definitely is growing in the wrong direction, right? In between this disconnection between contemporary art and the general people. Mm-hmm and the young generations of people, society, my friends yeah. coming from like, you know, having like top university degrees, top positions. They don't understand what they do, what we do. They love it, but they want to learn more. But the, the question of, I would love to go to the opening. Do I need to pay? Yeah. Can I ask for prices? Can I even like, you know, afford this work? Well, actually you can afford that work. Like many of the works, I mean, at the gallery, many galleries are selling like, you know, top price points, but also they have like works on paper or yes. small scale like paintings yeah. that they go for other prices, right? And this kind of huge disconnect between those, those I mean, the, the different audiences, right? The second was like also um, how many artists we know that they don't have gallery representation. And again, it's very important to say that it's definitely, there are different, different, uh, definitely, sorry, many levels, mm-hmm. right? But also there are many artists that they don't have a gallery representation yeah. because there are so many artists that you can show and so many artists that you can represent. So connecting the dots here and also thanks to the pandemic and this idea of the digitalization, right? The very rapid sh- shift between uh, that traditional Mm -hmm. brick and mortar gallery business concept versus like, you know, the whole new expansion and to the new horizons that technology can bring on creating different models and different type of platforms uh, brought me to think like, let's do something, let's change this at a very small scale. I co-founded this project with Blanca Pascual uh, in 2020. And it was like, it was a crazy, beautiful project. I mean, I, w- I always like kind of define it like very punk. Colleagues of mine, I mean, our artistic director, Omar, told me, Clara, are you crazy? <laughs> I mean, are you really doing this? And I said, you know what? Yes. And I believe in what we are doing. So. To be brief here, because I couldn't stay like, you know, going on forever on, on La Prera, it was a digital curatorial platform. So the idea was very easy and clear. A person that likes art, but that they don't know where to start, they are not gonna go to a gallery to buy art. You need to go to them. So it was digital in the idea. It was on WhatsApp. And then we also started like a, a mailing list where we like we were also emailing people with those presentations. So we created a network of artists, of collectors, of art enthusiasts, of many like people. I mean, we ended up having like, you know, collectors buying that they own galleries, that they like the proposition, because I'm going to tell you the proposition. That was the punk part of thing, uh, of the project. We were showcasing an, an artist or a selection of artists every month at a limited price of $600. Wow. So we weren't selling art value at $600. We were creating a special collaborations with artists so that in a selection of works, five at that time, and then we increase it to 10, and then we raise the price point at $1,000. And that selection of, 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 of works, they were priced at a maximum of $600 for two weeks only. So we were releasing the collection, to, the, to our network, which started at 300 and mm. ended up at 4,500 people. So crazy, I yeah. mean, the growth. And we were selling, I mean, we sold, the first year we sold 
art for $100,000 at a limited price, at a limited quantity of like no more than, I think that it was 10 works a month. So the interest was there. I always uh, say, and to me it was essential, that we needed to respect how the industry was doing things. So definitely we were very respectful on marking every work as a special collaboration price, having a PDF with additional price at the actual price yeah. point, uh, having a curatorial text, having like the CV of the artist and making sure that, you know, the, the, the curatorial selection that I was like very much like leading of course, with Blanca and, and the team, uh, was like, you know, like a strong selection of artists. And I showcased many artists that now are, are untitled at Felix, and, you know, represented by galleries in London, yeah. in, in the US. I mean, and it's, it's great to see that. And we couldn't do it without the, the initial support of those artists that believe in me and say, yeah, sure, do it. Uh, you know, let's let's do it together. Let's, you know, I definitely can allocate five works for that. But it was a great project. I mean, we, in 2023, we, and first of all, it was very difficult to combine all the positions. Yeah. It was very difficult to continue asking artists for work at that price yeah. point, because definitely it is true to say that, you know, at $600, no one makes money. So, I mean, this was definitely a, a, a project out of passion, which I think that is beautiful and it was the beauty of the project. However, I feel grateful and very happy and the mission is accomplished because we did manage in those three years to mine that gap and to connect people that weren't buying art with contemporary art. Also, this was free for everyone. This was in two languages, English and Spanish, very much connected to yeah. this, you know, interest of mine on like, you know, thinking uh, that, you know, like how many artists and many collectors and many, you know, like people, they don't necessarily have fluency in the English language. So that was essential for me to, to bring and, and to translate every text uh, into the Spanish language. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was great. Uh, it, we, it came to an end. I would love to think, you know, how I could potentially, you know, continuously like or rethink or reshape the project that is a little bit more like, you know, easy for me to, 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 to have it yeah. as, you know, a uh, love, passion, outside project. But, but yeah, this, is, this was La Perra. Um, again, it was like, at the beginning it was tricky. But I think that after people seeing that we were very serious on the selection, very uh, professional on the way that we were treating the $600 component, which still is like, you know, uh, you know people like started following us. Uh, many people like discovered many artists to us. Potentially they didn't buy, but there was a gallery discovering an artist from the US, mm -hmm. from, from Colombia or from Lebanon, or from like, you know, Hong Kong. So it was, yeah, a very rewarding, very rewarding project. I think that's really incredible because I always talk about accessibility to art by people who might not have the financial means of buying a $1 million painting. Um, and I feel like art should be accessible to everybody. Um, so I think coming in at that pro price point is great because when I first started out, like that was what I was able to afford um and you know build that interest in art um so i think that was that was really an incredible project yeah no again i mean i'm sad that it came to an end but definitely as i was taking a larger role at untitled it was very difficult to combine oh, yeah, I imagine. uh but definitely this is something that i try to also see how can i incorporate this and i was mentioning a lot this audience development and you know like engaging with uh, the collectors of the future or like, you know, audiences that they are not necessarily so familiar with what we are doing, but we are seeing like, you know, a great interest. I mean, fashion brands yeah. collaborating with art, sponsors collaborating with art. So definitely, you know, it's like many fields, not only like, you know, the 
the general public uh, or young collector kind of, you know, or younger audiences, but also like all these industries, tech industry, for instance, you know, it could be like, you know, it's also a very key uh, industry that we are looking at. How can we engage? How can we um, help them uh, and educate them and support them in the first uh, attempts to buy art and discover and starting creating and building an art collection? Yeah, no, and it's and it's becoming more and more aware, um, even re in the last few e recent years, how many creative industries began to overlap with yeah. art, design, furniture, fashion, um, all of these different ones. So I feel like art really does or ends up touching almost everything in some aspect. The only thing that I would like to ask here out loud is that this is great. And I love to see this. Uh, again, these are not different departments. This is like at the end of the day, culture and how culture can like, yep. you know, embrace like, you know, all the different industries. It is very important always to, to have committees that they are experts in this area that they know and they've been like, you know, like that they have a professional background and experience in contemporary art or in art in general, depending on what is like the medium or like, you know, the reach of that project. So that we make sure that, you know, that the collaborate collaborations that we are doing is with, uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of um, translates in like, you know, supporting the art ecosystem at large, supporting like, you know, many different media uh, and also like making sure that, you know, that we are showcasing and giving visibility to to, to, to the artists that I feel that they are more relevant, right? Yeah. To the contemporary art discourse. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for sharing all of that. Before <laughs> we end the episode with our fire round of questions, I do have the two most important questions that I always like to ask my guests towards the end of the episode, which is, one, have you faced any challenges in particular as a woman working in the arts? Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, I need to, I mean, I'm very thankful. I've been very supportive by all the people that I work with, uh, as a woman, you know, um, I didn't really like, you know, face any major challenge. I would say that, you know, of course the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all, I feel, but the, I feel that the answer is yes across the board yeah. and not only in the art world, right? I think that this is definitely, there is a lot still to be done in terms of equality, uh, not only for women, but for all the minority groups. Uh, yes. So this is essential. It is true to say that, you know, I, I agree with one of your speakers mentioning that the, the art world is a very women-centered industry. Uh, I, I've been very fortunate to be working, you know, with men that have always supported me. And if I may say, I don't know if this sounds a little bit weird, but even protecting me, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I never encountered nothing weird. Uh, I actually have always been working for uh, men, I mean, the directors, the founder of Untitled, like, you know, the directors of the galleries. Uh, uh, but again, you know, I never really like face anything that is major. Fun fact as well, you know, it's, it's, it's true to say, I remember um, at the VAP, when I was the head of VAP relations at Untitled, at the VAP desk, I don't know if this was a 2018, 2019 situation. I was at the desk. I wasn't providing a VAP pass to one attendee I'm not gonna disclose why but you know mm -hmm. uh but uh it wasn't it was I couldn't uh and then you know he it was a he in this case he mentioned well can you speak with with your superior with the director and I said sorry sorry what yeah you are you are looking at her right now so this is definitely you know this idea of in my case you know I always look in the young side of things mm -hmm. uh and you know this this potential way of people treating you as an assistant, uh, yeah. not as a director. But again, it's like, you know, you can, it's something very easy to overcome. I think that, you know, we can, what I would ask, and it's something that I ask across the board to all my, you know, um, male friends, family members, uh, you know, 
professionals that I work with is that this is something that we need to all be working together. And I think that it's very important for all of us to realize that there is still a lot to be done. Yes. And we are still facing this. Uh, but in my personal case, I'm very fortunate to always have been like, you know, surrounded by very supportive men and women. And again, you know, uh, but yeah, definitely there is, a, and that's very much why that were, uh, we put together the curatorial team last year of gender equality mm -hmm. in the arts. And many people might have thought that, listen, this is a little bit redundant. I mean, we already talk about that. No. no, I mean, no, sorry. And not in the art industry. And not when you look and you really like look deep at all these uh, art market, like, you know, reports and, you know, the situation of who is making it versus who is not and what is happening in the industry. So sorry, no, it's very important. But again, like, you know, also opening not only to women, but all the minorities, mm -hmm. all the different collectives, right? In terms of ethnicity as well, in terms of diversity, I mean, in terms of, you know, it's, it's very important to be, yeah, yeah asking 100%. ourselves and continuously like working and, and making sure that we are like, yeah, yeah. creating a positive change. Yeah, so I'm actually glad that you guys touched on that theme last year um, because this is a conversation that I feel like we should continue having. It's not like, oh, well, didn't we already talk about this? This is a conversation that needs to continue to happen until change is actually made. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, final question before we head into the fire round. Um, do you have any advice for incoming generations or women who already work in the arts that you'd like to share? Um, believe in yourself mm -hmm. and be unique to the person that you want to be. Uh, embrace your weaknesses, but also learn from them. I feel that, again, if I wouldn't apply to an internship because, they were, because I didn't speak German, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have gotten like my first professional opportunity within uh, the gallery world. So I feel that that is, you know, that has been like key to me. Very much remain unique. You know, I, after coming to the US, again, as I mentioned, you know, I'm not American. Uh, this has also been, and it continues to be a learning experience to me. You know, I, I, I feel that um, you need to make sure that you, I mean, questioning yourself is good, but not, a, not letting others to let you down mm -hmm. because of English as well as your second language or because you don't have a strong network of like, you know, of, of connections in the US. Well, I might not have had a strong network of, of connections in the US, but I did have a great connection uh, and network in Europe. Yeah. So let's look into what can you bring, right? How can you, uh, yeah, like how can you, bring all this expertise of yours uh, into whatever kind of like discipline that you want to and, and role that you want to accomplish within their world. But I feel that, you know, also being, to me, it will be very, like very much connected to being, being who you are and not pretending to be another person, being honest. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, being honest and listening to people is like, to me, key to, you know, who, who I am. Uh, also, like having very honest conversations with galleries or with artists, even if like, you know, like an artist that I might love, that I like, I've been representing forever. And the last series of work is, is less interesting. Well, how can you say that in a supportive way? Yeah. So, you know, those are like very much key. And then, and work hard. I mean, this industry, this is not an easy one. This is not like, you know, you have a law degree and then you get into a law firm. This is very much working in the art world. You need to make your way. You need to show who you are, potentially sometimes double, twice, right? In order to, yeah, to make sure that you achieve what you want. But I've worked very hard. I'm very happy of, you know, what I have accomplished to date. And um, yeah, it is, and also being passionate. I mm -hmm. mean, this is like, you know, the work-life balance in this industry is non-existent. Yes. 
Uh, but it's great because, you know, I, we still smile. I mean, you are doing this on a Sunday. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I work 24-7 every day. If I need to speak with a gallery or need to visit a gallery on a Sunday, I'm very, on a Saturday weekend, whatever, outside of work hours, I'm very happy to do that because this is actually my passion. And I really want to make, you know, like my contribution to, mm -hmm. to create, um, yeah, and to leave a sort of mark. So those would be like, you know, my advices. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting because I feel like I've seen that across every single person who works in the art industry that there is no life work balance here. Like this isn't like a nine to five admin job that you yeah. go and then you're like, okay, I'm gonna go home and hang out. Like we go to art openings, we go to studio visits. Uh, these things happen Monday through Sunday. Like art very much infiltrates every aspect of your life. Yeah. Um, because you just you love it so much that yes, it's both exactly. your job and your life no and even if it's a weekend it's like okay what is the plan of the weekend well yeah. shall we go to that museum because i didn't have the chance yet yeah. to see the show yes do it yeah i mean many friends you know they don't understand this you know it's like come on it's like you know it's, it's a friday at seven yeah. yeah it's a friday at seven and i need to send this email yeah. or i need to you know call this gallery uh yeah i feel that you know this is at the end of the day and a small world yes right and a small industry a people's business uh you know and it's like you know we work with friends we work with colleagues it's like yeah it's like a, a small family yeah and I even noticed this myself like when I take vacation time and like even if it's like a family vacation and I don't know we'll go to like Paris or Amsterdam or something like that I'm like okay what exhibition do I want to see like what's on view right now and they're like can you just not this is like a family vacation can you just relax I went to uh, Ibiza this uh, this summer for like pleasure um, and then you know I was like okay four days in Ibiza and I said which galleries do I need to visit? So yep. it's, it's crazy, but yeah. yeah, but we love it. And, yeah. you know, I love what I do. And you get to love it in order, you know, also to achieve uh, what you need, I mean, what you want to achieve in the art world. But definitely, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a work uh, out of passion. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so I think we're now ready for our fire round of questions. Oh my God. <laughs> These are all tough. Um, okay, so I'll ask you to pick a number between one and 10 and then I'll read the corresponding question. Okay, it's always seven. So okay, let's seven. Go for the seven. My favorite number. Same um, here. What is something that you think everyone should experience in their lifetime? Oh my God. Whatever. No, not art related. No, nothing. Just whatever you think. Uh, coming to New York for a couple of years. I think that that has been like a very kind of like, you know, open mind experience. I've been working again, as you know, and I live in many different cities, mm -hmm. Lisbon, uh, sorry, uh, um, Braga, I mean, Portugal, uh, Florence, London, now New York. Uh, and I think that New York is like, is always this uh, love-hate relationship with the city. But definitely, you know, in terms of like opening your mind um, and getting to experience all this, the diversity of this city and the energy of this city and, you know, how much is going on every day of, of the week. I think that that would be something that I recommend to everyone. And again, visa or not visa, you can make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> No, and I love that you mentioned the love-hate relationship with New York because I personally definitely have that. Like, I'm always like, oh, I'm so tired. I need to leave. This this city is just sucking me dry. And then I'm like, okay, I miss it. I need to go back. No, it's, 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 yeah, it's going to be a problem yeah. if we want to, like, leave the city. Uh, but, yeah, I think that also that keeps you in, in your toes. Like, you yeah. know, it's like this kind of energy. And it's a, man, a matter also of managing that energy yeah. and realizing that you might not be able to visit and attend every party, every opening or every reception, right? Um, it is like also like trying to find a good, like, you know, work-life balance and prioritizing like this weekend, I'm not doing anything yeah. or, or everything that I'm going to do is non are related and kind of yeah, work around that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. One more. Okay. Pick a number. One. One. Name an artist you admire. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, this is easy. Uh, well, easy and not easy because at the end of the day, you know, um, I work with artists yes. all day. So um, recently, mm -hmm. I would say, and it's actually the last work that I acquire, is uh, Iu Susiraja. Uh, it's a Finnish photographer. Mm -hmm. 
a video artist uh, and performer. Um, uh, she recently had a solo exhibition at the MoMA PS1. Uh, her work is, uh, is extraordinary. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with her work. No, no. Uh, she works with her body. She photographs herself. Uh, is to me where uh, Marina Abramovich uh, meets Anna Mendieta. I think that is also very relevant, the way that she captures uh, the female body with all the imperfections in a very real approach, but also kind of our history rooted way, uh, in the kind of like Northern European, like, you know, modern photography touch. And I'm obsessed with her work. I recently acquired one piece. Uh, yeah, and I've been following her closely, but I could mention many, many Oh, artists. I'm sure. <laughs> no, but thank you for mentioning that one, because I collect photography and prints and specifically women artists. So I definitely want to check out her work. Please um, do. Because it it's sounds a really very, interesting. It's, it's, um, to me, it's like a very captivating and strong like production. It's also very honest and not easy, I would say. For her, it's all about, um, you know, portrait in photography, mm -hmm. uh, but it's always, you know, the artist, like being naked to the wall, which yeah. I think that is also something that, you know, many artists, is like the fear of, of, of me coming to this interview and of artists showing the work for the first yeah. time or new pieces for the first time. At the end of the day, you are like, you know, you're exp placing your and exposing yeah. yourself. Yeah. 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 Um, so you mentioned that you collect... Do you collect any particular things or just whatever feels well, right? Well, I have a very eclectic collection, okay. but also because to me, I approach collecting as like a very kind of way of supporting artists mm -hmm. and art. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in the ultra emerging position. So many of the works that I collect, you know, uh, are like works by very emerging artists. I have a, a humble collection, uh, but yeah, definitely, you know, I try to, it's my way of supporting. I love an, an interview, an article uh, to Stefania Bortolami uh, about like, you know, what for her was, you know, collecting or like, you know, they were very much asking about art as an investment of course. asset, right? Yeah. And at the end of the day, uh, definitely there is a lot to talk about that side of like you know like collecting but i feel that also is very important to everyone like involved in this industry or that is interested in getting to know this industry better on how we can support artists and you support artists by collecting their work yes uh so yeah this is to me is very is, is essential so yeah which is i mean one of the reasons why i started collecting too is obviously to support artists uh, living artists yeah um yeah so not necessarily at top names exactly you know of course you know as i grow my collection i'm interested in incorporating like more established positions yeah. but also i'm very interested in like you know supporting an artist so that through that payment can visit and travel X city or like, you know, go to that residency. And I want to continue exploring that as well in yeah. terms of, you know, supporting artists. hundred percent. I see it the same way. Well, thank you for being here and for sharing all your experiences and giving us a lot to think about. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing Untitled this year and just really reconnecting back there after after seeing it. Well, thanks for having me. I'll wait for you and all of you uh, yes. <laughs> in Miami Beach this December. The fair will take place December 4th to the 8th with a okay. VIP um, and press preview opening on December 3rd on Tuesday. And also to the new uh, edition, the inaugural new edition of Untitled as soon as we are ready to announce it. To the world. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to hear it. So also looking out for that. Um, but yes, thank you. And to all my viewers and listeners, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you guys next week. Thank Bye. you. Bye.